Now we will hear Dr. Carl Baugh's message to touch the heart of God. We will learn the likely reason why David was so mistreated by his brothers and even his father. Some of what Dr. Ball will say comes from rabbinic sources outside the Bible. And we are careful not to equate tradition with scripture. But some of these Jewish traditions may help us understand why David was maligned and called a man after God's own heart. Our scene begins a few hundred yards from here where a young Jewish shepherd boy sits on the cap of a well outside ancient Bethlehem. In the distance, he can see the outline of the ancient city of Salem, now occupied by the Jebusites. This young shepherd boy is sitting in a still night, warm spring evening, it's Passover time. As he glances across the horizon, he sees some 60 or 70 yards away from where he's sitting on the cap of the well, the ancient threshing floor of his great grandfather, Boaz, who had a visitor one night who ultimately became his great grandmother. In the far distance, he can see the outline of the home place where his father, Jesse, lives and where his seven older sons live with his two older sisters. But tonight is different. It is still, it is quiet, too still. The young shepherd boy can normally concentrate on the creation of God in the heavens, the stars that God made. He can normally be preoccupied with the sheep and the young lambs, but tonight, everything is too quiet. The shepherd boy begins to weep. Tears flow down his cheeks and strike the sullen limestone of the cap of the well at Bethlehem. Then he begins to cry. His wails pierce the night with his sorrow. Sorrow too deep to express. Sorrow he's known since he was just a young boy. What's going on? As he contemplates the situation he's in, he remembers that periodically his father or his older brothers request that he bring one of the lambs, one of the lambs that he has birthed, has protected even from the lion and the bear, his own personal prowess, has kept the antagonist, the lion and the bear, from taking their prey. He rescues the prey and destroys the opposition. But tonight he can't get away from his sorrow. Thinking of the times he takes to the homestead, a lamb for a short feast. He has prepared the lamb, he has provided it. Yet he can't eat at the table with his father and with his older brothers. He's relegated to a corner in the large kitchen of the homestead. They feed him the scraps that are left over from the banquet. And then they sprinkle the scraps of the lamb and the feast with hemlock, gall. They give him sour juice to drink, vinegar, in hopes that somehow this individual that's not wanted in their life will disappear for one reason or another. But he has to return back down to the well, to the adjacent tower of the flock some 60 or 70 yards away, and intensify his own sorrows. He wrote about it. The heartbreak was more than any young man or any individual can bear under normal conditions. He wrote about it in Psalm 69. In fact, the title to it is Upon 
Shohanim upon the lilies, here among the lilies of the valley, here among God's creation, here among all the blessings is the deepest sorrow that a young man could ever be called upon to bear. He begins Psalm 69 with these words, Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. He begins with an exclamation of despair. I sink in deep mire, for there is no standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. I'm weary of my crying, and my throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. He's in absolute despair, and he pins it for the record. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. When something was missing in the environs of Bethlehem, maybe a, a garment, maybe a lamb, the word was that that kid down at the tower of the flock, that David must have taken it so. He had to restore that which he had not taken away. These are penned words of absolute agony and despair. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Let me be blameless before those who are really honest, he said, because that for thy sake I have borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face, and tonight the despair grips his soul with agony. I'm become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. This is what the elders of the little town of Bethlehem in ancient Israel at Ephrat, this is what the elders were talking about. His older brothers use the word Muzar, which is of the same derivative of Mamzar, which means an illegitimate son. My brothers think I'm illegitimate, and my father apparently thinks so too. This is my despair. I'm in absolute agony. He continued, for the zeal of thine house. They think they're doing right, but they're absolutely wrong. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was my reproach. They just made fun of me the more sorrow I bore. They that sit in the gates speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. This was the practice among those who ran the city and the elders of that little town of ancient Bethlehem. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord. You're the only hope I have. All of this occurred within a few hundred yards of where we're standing at this very moment. This literally occurred in history and its impact reaches to this very moment that we're producing this communication to you. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. He repeats again and again and again. This young man is burdened with a sorrow that no one should have to bear. It isn't just a fleeting moment of despair introduced into the winds of night. It's a situation he lives with every single day. He can't get away from it. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. And he continued, hear me, O Lord. He continued asking God his only hope to deliver him from this despair. He had borne it so many years and would bear it 
the rest of his life. Hide not thy face from thy servant, for I'm in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. It's more than I can bear. I'm full of heaviness. I look for some to take pity, but there was none. My own family, my own mother was quiet about the whole matter. God, you're the only one I can look to. They gave me gall, hemlock for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar, spoiled juice to drink. Let their table become a snare before them. God, meet upon them that which they've instituted, he said, and that which should have been for their welfare. Let it become a trap. They didn't have to do this. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them. He's being absolutely honest, not spiteful. They've, for his entire life, ridiculed him unmercifully without compassion. Let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten. Somehow, Lord, somehow you're involved in this and I'll accept your chastening for whatever I've done wrong. I'll accept your will in my life, whatever it is, but they persecute me beyond the providence you brought upon my life. And they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. This means they have determined their own destiny, not only in this life, but in the life to come. But I'm poor, that means humble and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God. What absolute faith this young man sitting on the sullen stone of the cap of a well just outside Bethlehem exercised. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hoofs. David, this young shepherd boy, realized that the shadows were not the reality, that the sacrifice of lambs and rams and bullocks and calves and heifers was not in itself a satisfaction the humble shall see thee and be glad, and thy heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and earth praise thee, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion, ultimately God will have his way, and Israel will triumph and will build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell therein and have possession. The seed also of his servants, his servants, those that know him, shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. How did this come about? How could a young man gifted with dexterity, brilliant in analysis, deep in his contemplation of the heavens and the earth, and deep in his response to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, how could this sorrow come upon his life? Actually, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, it says that he was a man after God's own heart. And in Acts chapter 13, it repeats the same statement. Here's a man after God's own heart, but is bearing the deepest of mortal wounds among the sons of men. How did this come about? Now the full answer 
is not written in Scripture. Often God does not reveal to us everything in this life that occurs to us, but in glory we shall know as we are known. What's the answer? This plight is so unusual. It is unique. It's one of a kind. How did it happen? The ancient Jewish rabbinical sages piece together reports that are only as good as scripture will verify and as time will vindicate. According to their literature, Jesse was the son of Obed, and according to scripture, that's true, who was the son of Boaz, ultimately the great, 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 great grandson of Isaac and Jacob and Abraham. Jesse was getting old. His grandmother was Ruth, a Moabitess, who had married his grandfather, Jesse's grandfather, Boaz, and the courtship took place just a couple of hundred yards from where we're standing at this moment, in the threshing floor of Boaz. One night, as he was protecting in his repository the grain, Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, paid him a visit. You see, a famine had come to ancient Bethlehem. Elimelech, Naomi, their sons had gone to neighboring Moab, where there was fruit in the fields. The two boys married Moabite girls. No children were granted to them. Elimelech and both sons died. That left Naomi, a widow, she said, I'm going back to Bethlehem. I hear there's bread there now. One daughter-in-law said, all right, I'm staying. The other daughter-in-law, Ruth, said, I'm going with you. No, stay with your family. No, she said, I've heard you speak of, and I have responded to, I have received the God of Israel, the God of creation. I no longer worship my pagan gods. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. And Ruth came back with Naomi. As Ruth came back with Naomi, they were welcomed. The town was prosperous again. But Naomi said, call me a lady of sorrow. In the short course of time, Ruth gained the favor of Boaz. Now that fateful night, when she approached honorably, virtuously, the area where Boaz was alone. As a result of that courtship, Boaz decided, I'm going to marry this young woman. And he got the special privilege. He had to actually take a nearer kinsman by his lot, and at great sacrifice, he married a Moabite. But now, the son, Obed, was born. Later in life, he had Jesse. Jesse had seven sons and two daughters. But he was getting old now, more reflective. So Jesse conferred with the elders of the city, and he had a problem. He said, because my grandfather married a Moabite, and according to the book of Deuteronomy, in the Torah, until the 10th generation forever, no Moabite is to enter into the family of Israel. But my grandmother is a Moabitess. Therefore, I may not be a proper Jewish citizen, married to a proper Jewish lady. So Jesse decided to send his wife, Netzbet, down the hill to the property he also owned in the original estate of Boaz, his grandfather, down to the tower of the flock. And 
There she stayed, there was water, there were shepherds nearby to attend to her. No problem, she would be all right. And he could live out the rest of his years with at least some peace of conscience. But in the course of time, he missed the patter of little feet. And his boys were still at home and his daughters were still at home. He wanted another child. So there was a handmaid, a maiden, a house lady in the home, a converted Canaanite. She was a believer, but she was a Canaanite that didn't have the curse of the Moabites. So he propositioned her, I'd like to marry you, I'd like for us to have children. And he set the date, he set the night of the consummation, and all of that was legal in ancient Israel. But the handmaid, the Canaanite convert handmaid, had served the real wife, Netzbet. She had a great admiration for her, so she made her way down, according to the sages, made her way down to the tower of the flock, and the two ladies got their heads together, and the Canaanite said, remember Rachel, and remember Jacob, and remember Leah, and there was an exchange on the night of the wedding. And Netzvet said, let's try it. So in the cover of darkness, she went to the home, participated with her real husband, Jesse, in the ecstasy and the consummation of the marriage, and then before dawn, covered by darkness, slipped away back down to the tower, and the Canaanite convert took her place back in the home. She had conceived that night, and in the course of a few months, she began to show. And the boys went to their dad, Jesse, and said, you won't believe what mama has gotten herself into. She's showing, she's pregnant. And Jesse said, that's not my kid. And therefore, even before the birth of David, there was a major conflict among the elders and the drunkards and the home folk. It was a problem he would live with all his life. So in the isolation in the lower area of the tower of the flock, an ancient tower that had been built for protection and for care of the sheep, Rachel had died within the shadows of that tower in ancient time. David was born in the lower section in the apartment living quarters hewn out of the soft limestone of the tower of the flock, David was born there. No wonder this night, in the quiet stillness of a warm spring Passover evening, silhouette are all of these features reminding this young man of his sorrow too deep to bear. No wonder, no wonder he writes this psalm. But he survived against the will of his brothers. He survived and Samuel the prophet and the judge. Samuel was instructed of God to anoint this young man as the future king of Israel. Now, God had prepared this young man in a special dimension and had thought the thoughts that God wanted him to reflect upon. So Samuel came. He asked Jesse about his sons. The seven boys one at a time passed by. God said in Samuel's heart, that's not it. And he said, isn't there another lad? Well, Jesse could respond to that and said, oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's another one but he's tending the sheep down in the field of Ephrata, uh, down beyond the tower of the flock. It'll take some, what Samuel said, bring him here. He brought him and little did the boys, little did Jesse, little did the elders present on that occasion understand the full impact. He was anointing David to be king. David lived his life, never lost a battle. But during the course of his life, he never got away from the burden he bore as a child. In fact, the sages tell us that Samuel 
wrote the book of Ruth, defending David and his father and his family as proper Israelites, duly authorized and qualified to be king of Israel. And the book of Ruth bears that out in detail by the grace of Almighty God. So now, we come to the life of this young man. He was anointed king without their even knowing the full implications. He became king. He never lost a battle. But even his own son Absalom believed the rumors that had carried throughout his life and against his father rebelled and for a period of time became the king. So how is it? God said to Samuel, this one you're going to anoint is a man after my own heart. And Acts 13 verifies David was a man after God's own heart. How is it that David, with all of these burdens, with all of this history, was a man after God's own heart? Well, theologians have ventured a guess. Perhaps the fact that David was victorious in battle. He never lost a battle. He was surrounded by 37 mighty men. God is always victorious. He's never lost a battle, never will. And perhaps that's what's meant by the statement, he's a man after God's own heart. Or secondly, David had great compassion in friendship. Jonathan, the first chapter of 2 Samuel says that David loved Jonathan more than the love of women. And yet David was fully masculine in all his details and, and so was Jonathan. So maybe that compassion beyond the normal compassion of a warrior general to be, maybe that's what is meant by the fact that he's a man after God's own heart, the great compassion illustrating what God has. Or number three, David had an encompassing knowledge. You see, God prepared him among the sheep, and sheep each have a personality. Now, I understand directly from the shepherds that if you tend a flock for a while, every single day, each of those sheep will make his way into the presence of the shepherd to personally be around the one who is leading them beside the still waters and in the green pastures. David learned personalities. He learned dexterity in running up and down the ledges of these limestone hills. But he learned how to interpret people because he experienced the rawest, the deepest, the raunchiest character from his own family. So he understood people just by being in their presence. And the Bible says when he became king, David didn't need people to come and give him the gossip. He didn't need people to inform him what was going on. He innately knew what was happening all around him in battle and in peace and in administration. Well, that encompassing knowledge certainly is illustrative of God's knowledge. But number four, perhaps it's meant that he was conservative in his assets. You see, whatever God builds works. We tear it up, but God will restore it. All the heavens that God created are still there, and one day they will fold together as a scroll, but then eventually God will remake all of that. God conserves all his assets, and particularly those who know him personally. He's never lost a child. And for those who trust him from this particular communication, you trust him and he'll never abandon you, he'll never lose you. God conserves his assets. David conserved his assets to the point where he had the amount of gold, the amount of silver, the breastplates, everything prepared to build the temple like no other wonder on the face of the globe. But he was a man of war and a man of blood. Therefore, his son built the temple. But David conserved the assets to make that possible. Maybe that's what's meant by he was a man after God's own heart. Or, number six, he was firm in his foundations. You see, 
David bought the threshing floor of Arona. He bought the entire territory, and he bought the oxen to sacrifice there. And Arona said, you're a good king. You're a good man. I've watched you. I don't believe the stories. I want to give it to you. David said, no, I will not sacrifice that to God, which doth cost me nothing. I'm going to pay for it. So he paid 600 shekels of gold. That was a treasury in those days and 50 shekels of silver for the threshing floor and the oxen and the wood for the sacrifice. Now, that's amazing because that is a document to this day. The Jews own this territory. Mount Moriah that he was buying was bought with a price. The former owner is listed, the owner at that time, and the posterity all listed. The price was listed in a document. David was very firm in the foundations he built. Or number six, he was faithful in his relationships. Even Absalom, his son, who rebelled against him as David was crossing Kidron to the other side, he wept. Absalom had stolen his throne, had tens of thousands following him. But David wept and said, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, I would to God that I had died for thee. That's the love of a father. That is a relationship that is beyond the normal course of human integrity. Perhaps that's what's meant. Or, number seven, he was undaunted in opposition. Goliath. David was young and ready. But David said, you come to me with a spear and a shield in the name of your pagan gods. I come to you in the name of the God of Israel. He selected five smooth stones. That's the number of grace, but he only needed one. Maybe he thought Goliath has four brothers I'll need to take care of in the future. And with that stone, he slew Goliath. But there's an amazing addition to that. He cut off his head and he brought his head to Jerusalem even before it was known by the name Jerusalem. It was still Jebus, the Jebusite city of pagans. It had previously been Salem, where Melchizedek was high priest, the priest of the Most High God. He brought the head here in anticipation of his future dedication to God. Maybe the fact that God does everything with a future plan and purpose is what's meant by David was a man after God's own heart. Or lastly, for our brief consideration, David was kind in victory. You see, Saul and Jonathan and brothers were impaled in corpse against the wall of Bethshean to be ridiculed. Later, their bodies were taken down and burned. But as David rightfully took the place of the throne, his rightful place on the throne, he asked, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to, especially to Jonathan's family? And there was a little boy named Mephibosheth. He was about six years old when the kingdom was transferred when the first trouble started. And Saul had to abdicate, and all his family did, and Jonathan's family was no exception. The nurse dropped this little boy, broke his leg and hip, and he was lame the rest of his life. So the years went by, and after David was established, he said, I'd like to show kindness. Perhaps a number of years had gone by, and they said, well, there is one. He lives in the land of Lodabar, the land of no pasture. His name is Mephibosheth. So David brought Mephibosheth. He sent a special royal cart for him. Oh, that's a reminder that our great king is coming back one day, and he's, he's coming and calling us by name. And, and David called Mephibosheth by name, and he said, you're not going to live just in Jerusalem. 
You're going to live in my house. You're going to be fed at my table. And the rest of his life, Mephibosheth dined within sight of the king. As we look back upon the very text by divine inspiration, Holy Writ was penned, David wrote. He began his agony of explanation with an exclamation point. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. You see, a thousand years went by. David was buried. His body rotted and went back to the elements. Maybe God has forgotten his promises. Maybe God didn't hear as the sweet singer of Israel penned the Psalms. The descendants of David came and went. Some were good like Josiah, some were wicked like Manasseh and his grandson Jehoiakim, and Israel had to be departed. But there is no way that the sages could explain and the prophets could explain how a man after God's own heart could go through these deepest sorrows. A thousand years went by. But then one night, a little baby boy was born. He was a descendant of David. His foster father, Joseph, was a descendant through Solomon. But his mother was a descendant through Nathan. An amazing thing happened. With the whimper of a little baby, satisfied, nestled to the breast of a virgin mother, little Yeshua, Emmanuel, God with us, was born. An angel sang, Mary was a descendant of David, of Judah, but Mary's first cousin was Elizabeth. She was of the family of Aaron, and there's a blending here. She understood what the sacrifice of a lamb meant to the degree that she could. Eight days later, they took baby Jesus to the temple compound, and Simeon raises him up, and he said he's going to bless the nations of the world. But, young lady, a sword shall pierce thine own heart. You see, the story had already gotten around. Joseph is not the father of Mary's baby that's to be born. It took a visit from God himself to overcome the hesitation in the heart and mind of this just and noble man, Joseph. So from before his birth, Jesus was relegated like David of old to a position to question his legitimacy. In the eighth chapter of the book of John, the tender book of the New Testament, in the eighth chapter, Jesus was disputing with the Pharisees and doctors of the law like he'd done as a 13-year-old long, long years before, 20 years or so before. And he was disputing with them, and they quickly said, we be not born of fornication. We know this old story about you. So we come back to David in these concluding moments, where David writes in Holy Writ, inspired of God in Psalm 69, Save me, O God, the waters are coming unto my soul. This is fulfilled at Gethsemane. Matthew 26, 38, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And where David said, My throat is dried from my crying. In Luke 22, 44, Jesus at Gethsemane sweat great drops of blood. And on the cross he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in John 19, 28, he cried, I thirst. In John chapter 15, he answers the plea a thousand years and more that David uttered. He said, I restored that which I took not away, and they hated me without a cause. In John 15, Jesus said, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. But this has come to pass, 
that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And God will give us grace. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Now to the brothers. Do you realize that Jesus' own half-brothers came to visit him with his half-sisters, and Mary Joseph was already gone? But the Bible says they didn't believe on him. Their own half-brother was God incarnate, the child of their own mother, but they didn't believe it. So, in Psalm 51 and in Psalm 69, said, I was shapen in iniquity, in sin did my mother conceive me, due to the discord, and then the Mutsar, the root of Mamzer, my brethren, believe I'm illegitimate. So this is fulfilled. Even Joseph was originally minded to put her away. The money changers were thrown out by Jesus. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now, he said, they that sit in the gate speak against me, David wrote, and I was the song of the drunkards. Matthew 27, 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of son. In the 17th verse of David's psalm, he said, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I'm in trouble, hear me speedily. Matthew 27, 46, Jesus cried on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Just hours before, Luke 23, 18 records, and they cried all at once saying, away with this man, reproach and dishonor. The spear, the blood, the water, the broken heart, even his own disciples forsook him and fled. Verse 21 of Psalm 69, they gave me gall, hemlock, for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar. Matthew 27, 39, hemlocks. Hemlock seeds and pods when mature, bow their heads and in the wind they shake. The scripture says in Matthew 27, they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and they gave him vinegar to drink. Now we see how David bore many of the things that only God's son could bear for the entire human race. David for himself, Jesus for all of us. But he didn't conclude it there. He said, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. Revelation chapter five fulfills this. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy, O lamb, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And then it was begun by David's own psalm of victory in anticipation in Psalm 24, 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? It's not me, David said. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And then he said, better than oxen and bullocks is the mercy of God. Hebrews 9, 12 says, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, those were shadows and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Finally, verse 36 of his Psalm reads, the seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Revelation 21, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and God will be with them and God shall wipe away all tears. David, even yours, along with ours. And God will be their God and they shall be his son. 
Now, how is it? Abraham is called the friend of God, but it's never said he was a man after God's own heart. Moses wrote the oracles of God, the basis for all scripture, but he's never called a man after God's own heart. Joshua was mighty in battle and conquered all of this land on which we're standing at this very emotional moment. But he's never called a man after God's own heart. The three worthies, without any blame, genuinely cast on their lives. Noah, Job, Daniel, blameless, like Joseph, according to the flesh, but they're never called a man after God's own heart. Well, 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer, we shall reign with him. Romans 8.18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God keeps a book of remembrance, Malachi 3, 16. God bottles up our tears and writes them in a book, Psalm 56, 8. You see, to suffer is to be human. To suffer for Christ is to be prepared to rule and reign with him. But to suffer with Jesus touches the heart of God.